My wife's friend accused Maine of wanting more than friendship. Now she's trying to ruin our marriage. My wife Emily has this longtime friend Leslie, who's recently become a single mom. Leslie's been struggling no car, working two jobs, and just trying to hold it all together. Emily, being the kind-hearted person she is, took it upon herself to help Leslie out. And since Emily started helping, I've been roped into it too, driving Leslie and her kids around, taking them to school, appointments, groceries basically filling in when Emily or others couldn't. At first, I didn't mind. It made my wife happy, and I get it Leslie's going through a tough time. But things have escalated. Now Emily's inviting Leslie and her kids over all the time, planning trips like camping and fishing, and when Emily can't make it, I'm the one left to entertain Leslie and her kids solo. I thought it was no big deal. I've known Leslie as long as I've known Emily, so whatever, right? Well, fast forward to last weekend. Leslie's kids were staying with their dad, so Emily thought it would be nice to have Leslie over for a chill night with dinner and movies. Emily was busy, so she asked me to text Leslie the invite. I shot her a message saying, Emily wants to know if you'd like to come over for dinner and movies on Saturday and then, Leslie hits me back with, just as friends, right? I'm not interested in being anyone's girlfriend. Now, I'm floored, like what? Where did that even come from? I asked her why she'd say that, and she replies something along the lines of, no guy would be helping me out unless he wanted something in return. I was shook. I immediately showed the text to Emily and told her I was done helping Leslie out. I didn't want to be put in any situation that could lead to more weird accusations like that. Emily believed me but wanted to talk to Leslie to get to the bottom of it. Leslie told her the same thing she told me that she was just having a bad day and her emotions were all over the place. Fine, but I'm still not cool with being involved anymore. I told Emily to leave me out of any future plans involving Leslie. I mean, it only takes one bad day for things to get messy again, and I don't want any part of that. Emily thinks I'm overreacting and that I should just let it go since it was, according to her, a simple miscommunication. But I'm not down with risking another awkward or accusatory situation just because Leslie was having an off day. I didn't even get an apology directly from her just one to Emily. To be honest, I don't think I'm in the wrong here. I was just helping out like Emily asked, and now I'm being cautious to avoid any more uncomfortable misunderstandings. But Emily's not happy that I've drawn a line in the sand. So Ada for refusing to help anymore after this whole weird situation? Emily and I had a long talk. I brought up both my feelings and some of the points you all made about how this situation could have been weird from Leslie's side, too. I showed Emily my post and explained why I felt uneasy enough to step back. Eventually, Emily got it. She agreed to talk to Leslie again to see if Emily's absence from a few events made Leslie uncomfortable, or if there was something else going on. We also discussed whether we've been overhelping. Emily admitted she might be doing too much, but she still wanted to help Leslie because that level of support was normal between them. However, Emily agreed to stop asking me for help when she couldn't be there. Instead, she planned to talk to Leslie about getting more support from the kid's father now that her ex-fiancé was out of the picture. After a couple of weeks, things took a turn. There were a few times when neither Emily nor Leslie's other friends could give her a ride, and Leslie started asking Emily where I was and why I wasn't helping. Emily stuck to the plan and explained that I was stepping back to avoid any future misunderstandings. But then Leslie started suggesting that if I didn't have ulterior motives I wouldn't be avoiding her. She even told Emily that my behavior was proof I must have wanted something more from her. From there it spiraled. Leslie told Emily that I acted the same way when Emily and I first got together helping her out, being super involved, and that's how she knew I had feelings for Emily. She warned Emily that I would leave her just like Leslie's ex left her. That was the final straw for Emily. She told Leslie that, until she seeks counseling to deal with her breakup, and stops projecting her negative outlook on our relationship, their friendship would be on hold. Emily's been having a tough time with it, and I've been doing my best to support her. But we've minimized contact with Leslie, and things are a lot less stressful on our end. Comment info how long have you and your wife been acting as Leslie's chauffeurs and doing everything for her? What is Leslie's plan to get her own life back together? Op reply it's been about four months. Leslie is trying to save up to get a new used car or her current one fixed as well as looking for a cheaper place to live. Info does she have trauma in her background? This sounds more like someone who has learned people give nothing for free and has been betrayed or hurt in the past. No idea. NTA but only because Leslie didn't apologize. And I don't think you're in the wrong for not helping her anymore. This is kind of a weird situation. Like if my friend asks me to go fishing with me and my kids, 
then sends her boyfriend slash fiance slash husband in her place. That's pretty weird. If it was just an errand, that's one thing, but a whole ass fun trip is super weird. I would just cancel the plans at that point. Also, was this fishing and camping trip just you, Leslie and her kids, or were there others involved? So I can actually kind of get Leslie's side because this time, you directly texted her from your phone right. When your wife sets up these errands slash play dates, I'm guessing she initially says it'll be her. Then shit might come up and so maybe half the time, she then tells Leslie that you're coming. So a direct text to Leslie from you asking to come over for movies kinda does feel pretty off. Also you say paraphrase here. No guy would be asking me and my kids how we're doing or helping me out unless he wanted something in return. But I'm curious what exactly the text messages say. Op reply my wife made the camping trip. One of the fishing trips when my wife couldn't make it and we knew ahead of time, we discussed canceling. She discussed it with Leslie, and they both decided to go ahead with it. The other time my wife organized us all going to do something together. She was with us for about an hour before she had to leave. I did directly text her from my phone, which I've had to do before. My text read, Emily wants to know if you'd like to come over for dinner and watch some movies on Saturday. I don't know about 100% of the time, but I have heard my wife tell Leslie she'd be sending me in her stead on a number of occasions, so it's not as if Leslie didn't have heads up. Info NTA. Did she apologize to you in addition to Emily? That's what kind of sets it off. She can have an off day and feel like maybe everyone has an ulterior motive and get snappy but like she needs to apologize to the person she hurt, i.e. you. If you're worried she's going to like, make a move on you and she's done more than this comment that's different too. No, she did not apologize to me. Only to Emily. NTA. I think there is more of a miscommunication between your wife and her friend. When your wife cannot drive or entertain her friend, does she let her friend know you are taking her place or that she volunteered you herself? Or do you just show up? The friend might be confused in this situation. While I understand the single mother's frustration, she needs to figure this out for herself. She cannot nor should she depend on everyone else forever. Also, where are the kids' father in helping in their appointments? I don't know about each and every time, but I have been witness to my wife giving Leslie a heads up I would be showing up instead. Such as one outing Emily planned, I suggested canceling when Emily's schedule changed but after Emily and Leslie discussed it they decided to go on ahead without Emily because Leslie's kids were looking forward to it. NTA. But forgive her and move on. People get silly notions and she's recently been abandoned, right? You've been very nice and she didn't understand that your wife was directing it. I'm sure she's embarrassed enough, so it would be nice to accept her apology and not withhold your help. Op reply she knew my wife was directing it and she did not apologize to me. My girlfriend's controlling dad banned Maine from their house. Now she's finally moved in with me to escape the toxicity. So, I'm 23, and I've been dating this girl for about a year and three months now. When we first started dating, she warned me that her parents, especially her dad, were kind of crazy. At first I thought she was just exaggerating, but man, was she not joking. In the beginning, everything seemed cool. There weren't any major issues with her family, and she told me they actually liked me. Her dad, though? He's one of those my way or the highway types. He's super strict and controlling, like he has this crazy amount of influence over her. She's got a curfew and staying over at my place. Yeah, that's absolutely out of the question. I mean, I get it. She still lives at home, and I try to respect that, but sometimes it just feels like too much. She's not even allowed to come with me on weekend trips with my family, even though her parents are invited to come too. There was this one time, though, when he said yes to her joining us on a camping trip. But boy, did that go south fast. So, we're out there just about to fall asleep, when she gets a text from her mom saying to call her immediately. The cell service where we were camping was spotty, so we had to rush out to the road to get enough signal to make the call. When she finally reaches her mom, we find out that she's already on her way to pick her up. Like we'd literally driven past her mom on the road and didn't even realize it was her. Apparently her dad decided he didn't want her to stay on the trip after all. No reason he just changed his mind and sent her mom five hours out to get her. Of course, at first we thought something terrible had happened. I mean, why else would someone drive all that way in the middle of the night? Turns out nothing was wrong, he just regretted letting her come. So, we stand there for two hours while her mom lays into me, criticizing me for things as dumb as the kind of music I listen to. And let me remind you, her parents were invited on this trip, but they chose not to come. They ended up staying the night with us, but her mom left before the sun was even up because she didn't want to be seen. When my girlfriend got home that weekend, her mom was in trouble with her dad for going to get her. You know, because that would have made him look bad for going back on his word. 
And my girlfriend? She was in trouble too for not listening to her mom. It's nuts, right? And that's not even the worst part. But now her mom's always been pretty nice to me. She's made me coffee, sent me home with leftovers, it's been chill. Her dad, on the other hand, has been polite to my face but always seems to have something to say behind my back. Like he'll complain to her about random stuff, like the car I drive. It's not a Toyota, so apparently that's a problem? Seriously? So family day comes around and I invite her parents to go at Ving with my family at my dad's place. I've invited them before, but this time they actually agree to come. But the morning of, her dad suddenly decides he doesn't feel well and backs out, which was fine, I wasn't gonna pressure him. He tells her mom she can still go though, so she packs up the ATVs, loads the truck, and gets ready to head out. Then, right as they're about to leave, her dad starts telling her mom that it's not a good idea for her to go because she's never towed that specific trailer with that truck before. Keep in mind she's been driving big trucks and trailers for over 30 years they used to own a landscaping company together. But of course she starts second-guessing herself and ends up bailing on the trip. Even though she decided not to tow the trailer, she still came up to join us and we had an awesome day. But when she got home, her dad was furious that she went without him. He ended up kicking her out of the house. She stayed at a friend's place for a few days and then went back to talk things through with him. That's when my girlfriend overheard them talking about me well more like him yelling at her mom. He was accusing her mom of emotionally cheating on him with me because of how nice she's been to me. You know, like making me coffee or sending me home with leftovers. Apparently that's a big issue because, in his eyes, I haven't put in the work yet. Whatever that even means, it's gotten to the point where he's basically mentally abusing everyone. He's playing these mind games, trying to get them to do whatever he wants. Nobody's allowed to have their own opinions or make their own decisions. Recently he told me I'm not welcome at their house anymore which sucks because my girlfriend and I live about an hour apart. In the past, he complained that I didn't come around enough, and now he's banning me for no real reason just because her mom's been nice to me. It's not even just that. Her parents don't even sleep in the same bed anymore. One night, her mom tried sleeping in the bed I usually sleep in when I stay over, and her dad lost it. He accused her of only sleeping there because I did. He got so mad he punched a hole in the door while she was trying to sleep. When they listen to him and do exactly what he says, Everything's fine. But the second they go against him, it's like the whole world falls apart. There have been so many situations like this over the years. My girlfriend's mom has been kicked out of the house so many times, all for reasons as petty as this. Everyone tells her she should leave him me, my family, her family, even her boss. She called a women's shelter once, and they told her to leave too. But she won't. I've given up trying to convince her. Recently, her mom booked a trip for her and my girlfriend to go to England to visit her own mother who's battling cancer. She hasn't seen her in over 10 years. But after the whole family day situation, her dad made her cancel the trip. He told her that if she went, it would mean she didn't love him. And so she canceled it. My girlfriend was devastated. I mean, she's heartbroken over it. There's honestly so much more to this. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. My girlfriend and I are okay, but her dad's constant manipulation keeps sucking her back in. He makes her feel like a terrible daughter, and he constantly tells her mom she's stupid for letting her date me. I recently told her she could move in with me to get away from all this, but she seems hesitant to leave her parents behind. I get it, it's her family, but at the same time, I'm not sure how much longer I can deal with all of this. I don't want to be the guy who walks away from a relationship because of her parents, but I can't see a future where I'm constantly dealing with this level of drama. It's not just about me anymore. I can't imagine bringing future kids into this situation, constantly worrying about her family's next blow up. So, I sat her down and told her how I've been feeling. I explained how much her family's drama stresses me out and how I don't see a happy future for us if things don't change. I love her. But I also need to protect myself. She was upset, of course. She reminded me that I'd promised not to leave her because of her parents, and the guilt hit me hard. But I told her that I'm not just thinking about us anymore. I don't want to bring future kids into this kind of toxic environment. My days shouldn't be spent worrying about what her parents are going to do next. Something must have clicked for her because she finally asked if the offer to move in was still on the table. I told her it was, of course. And she said she couldn't bear the thought of losing me over her parents. She didn't want to keep going backward, so she packed up her things and moved in with me. She told her dad off before leaving, and now we're unpacking her stuff and settling in together. She's agreed to limit contact with her parents and make sure that any relationship she has with them won't involve me unless we both agree. And honestly, I think this is a huge step for us. I finally feel like we've got a shot at a real future together. Relevant comments. Commenter NTA. Her father is a problem, not her or you.
He's also not going to change, but she's not ready to leave home yet because it's very hard to leave an abusive situation even if you are an adult. Op reply, she has shared that fear with me before. That she's afraid everything will crumble if she's not there and that her mom will bear the brunt of the fallout. I think she once described it as being afraid her mom will be punished for her gaining her freedom comment or perhaps your GF is scared to leave her mom alone with him? Does your GF have any siblings? The dad seems a massive bully and mom is copying his awful behavior in a bid to appease him. There's nothing you can do to fix or change this situation for your GF or her mom without them first taking steps to leave this horrid man. You can either suck up the difficult situation or perhaps end it but say that if they she ever want to change their circumstances you will help them any way you can. Op reply she's an only child. I think she feels bad leaving her mum behind or like feels obligated to stay with her family. I was asked to bring an extra gift for my son's friend's brother. Now the parents are calling us out for cheaping out. I've got three kids an eight-year-old son, a five-year-old son, and a one-year-old daughter. My younger son is friends with a kid from his class. Let's call him Mikey. Mikey's got an older brother James who's in the same class as my older son. Thing is, my son and James aren't friends, they just don't hang out like that. Anyway, back in March, James got sick with the flu, and his birthday party got cancelled. Mikey's mom put this message in the class mom group chat, but we didn't really pay attention to it because, well, my older son wasn't even invited to that party in the first place. Like I didn't even know the kid's birthday was coming up, let alone that he had a party planned. No biggie, right? Fast forward to now. My younger son just got an invite to Mikey's birthday party which is set for early June. Cool, my son's excited, we're all good. But here's where it gets weird. On the invitation, there's this little note saying, oh by the way, please bring an extra gift for James, because he missed out on his party, wait, what? My wife and I were both like, huh? Why are we being asked to buy a gift for James? I mean, my son's not even friends with him and we weren't invited to that cancelled party. Plus, it's Mikey's birthday, so it feels kind of weird to be showing up with a gift for his brother, too. We decided to ask Mikey's parents what's up with this, and they hit us with the explanation well, since James couldn't have his friends over for his birthday, we thought this would be a good opportunity for them to still give him gifts. I mean, seriously? We were just kind of stunned. Like, is that even fair to Mikey? It's his day, but now he has to share the spotlight with his brother who's basically crashing his party for some belated birthday presents. After chatting with my wife, we agreed that we weren't going to get James a gift. Our reasoning was pretty simple. One, our son's not friends with James. Two, he wasn't invited to the original party. And three, it just doesn't make sense to give a gift to a kid during his brother's birthday party. Feels off, you know. So we told Mikey's parents our decision, and let's just say they weren't happy about it. They basically said we were being petty and vindictive, like we were trying to punish James just because our son doesn't like him or something. Which, for the record, isn't true at all. It's not like my son dislikes James, they just aren't buddies. Then, things got even more heated. Mikey's mom came back with a threat to uninvite my younger son from the party if we didn't reconsider. His dad wasn't as harsh about it, but he still thought we were making the wrong call. Now, my wife and I are stuck. We don't want to deprive our son of a fun party with his friend, but we also feel like this whole thing is super unfair, especially to Mikey. Why should we have to buy two gifts when we were only invited to one party? Relevant comments, commenter. So for starters, you are most definitely NTA here, and the parents are incredibly strange and entitled for this. However, it makes me feel badly for both of their children. It is not you and your wife's job to provide gifts for the older child. But I would look at it like this, how important is Mikey to your child? Could you spare even a small gift for the older child, even if it is from the dollar store so your son could spend time with a friend who is important to him? It makes me feel like the children are not treated right by their parents, and it makes me feel sad to see this kind of behavior from them. You are not wrong. Oop, while I wouldn't say money is a problem here, we're not made of it. My daughter turned one weeks ago and we'll have family coming over from our home country in July, so we're trying not to spend too much. Even if I looked for an inexpensive birthday gift, I have no idea what James likes, and neither does my son. I also would not give it to him during Mikey's birthday party. I know it was their parents' decision, but if I wouldn't do it to my own kids, I won't do it to theirs. Commenter op. Are they also inviting your older son to the party? Is he getting food and cake as well? then maybe a gift is fair to offset the costs of him as a guest. Oop, my older son is not invited to the party, only my younger son. 
commenter NTA. Super weird. You literally couldn't pay me a million dollars to be in a classroom mom group chat oop my wife is there because they give out information about the school sometimes, but she hates it. Commenter, so I think you're NTA for not wanting to get a gift for the older kid it's not his B-Day, your son isn't friends with him, and your son wasn't even invited to his original party. I think it was tacky of the parents to request gifts on the invitation. However, I think you made a problem where there really wasn't one. They can't force you to gift something to their other children. They included a tacky reminder on their invite, but that doesn't mean you have to do anything about it. I wouldn't have contacted them and made this into an issue. I would have just ignored it and shown with a gift for Mickey and called it a day. If they had the audacity to question you at the party, I would have just feigned ignorance and said you didn't notice anything about another gift. I think this whole thing could have been avoided, but you made it into a big deal. At this point, I probably just wouldn't go if these people are going to hold your younger son's invitation hostage and demand gifts for their other kid. That's ridiculous and I wouldn't want to spend my time around them the main piece of advice I got when I first posted here or at least the one that stuck with me the most was to buy a smaller, inexpensive gift for James. I was more than fine with doing that, but I had no idea what he liked. I also didn't want to give him that gift during his brother's birthday party, as that didn't feel fair to Mikey. My wife and I talked, and we settled on getting James a gift card to a bookstore. We also had our older son give it to him at school, days before the party. He said James was grateful. Later that day, the boy's mom texted the mom group chat, saying she didn't want people cheaping out on James just because it wasn't his birthday. My wife agrees that it felt targeted, but we can't prove anything. Either way, we've given him a gift. We don't need to indulge in this any more than we already have. We'll just complain to each other. Our younger son wasn't uninvited from the birthday party. I was working, so my wife took him. According to her, the party was clearly Mikey's. The only thing indicating otherwise was the fact that James opened his gifts during it. My wife said she avoided their parents, but did get a few dirty looks from them, especially when Mikey opened the gift my son had picked out. It was a Spider-Man toy car that he thought Mikey would like. We'd bought it before this whole fiasco. Since we actually know Mikey, it was more personal than the gift card. I still don't understand a single decision the boy's parents made but I'm glad my son's friendship is intact. I just hope my wife and I don't need to interact with that family too much in the future. Relevant comments. Commenter, I can't believe you actually gave a gift and went to the party. This is ridiculous and disgusting that they would even write on the invite to bring the sibling a gift. I would have not went and kept my family away from that shit storm. Oop, we didn't want to upset our son. He wanted to go to the party, so we let him. Whatever problems we had with James and Mikey's parents are none of his concern. Commenter, I know people recommended that at the behest of the children, but it feels like you've just taught their parents that the behavior was okay. Why wouldn't the kids who were going to go to the other boys' party not go to this new one? Why didn't they just throw a combined birthday for both of them, where each friend brought a gift for the person they were going to originally? Also, the entire message of don't cheapen out would have had me cancel going altogether. Now neither of their children get a gift, and they get to miss out on my kid at their party. I'll take my kid out somewhere fun with the money we would have wasted on their brats. Oop, as much as I don't regret getting James a gift, I'm very upset at his parents. The kids didn't deserve any of this. My ex-wife left me when I was paralyzed, took my kids and spread lies. Now, 12 years later, my kids are finally moving in with me. I'm Jason, 47, and I need to vent and get some advice. This whole thing started 12 years ago when I was married to Susan, my first wife. We had been together for seven years and had two kids, Laura and Lucas, who were five and three at the time. Everything was pretty normal until one day, everything went sideways. So, one morning I was driving to work when this speeding car came out of nowhere and smashed into mine. Next thing I know, I wake up in a hospital bed, all bandaged up. The nurse told me I'd been out for two days. I was grateful to be alive, but that was just the beginning of a nightmare. After a week, the doctor hit me with the news I was paralyzed from the waist down and might never walk again. I was shattered. Susan was a wreck too, trying to juggle everything at home with the kids. I fell into a deep depression, stuck in that hospital room, feeling like my life was over. I was heartbroken about not being able to play soccer with my kids or dance with my wife. To make things worse, Susan started visiting less and less. At first, she brought the kids a few times a week, but then those visits became rare. I begged her to bring them around more, but she kept saying they didn't want to see me. Then one day she shows up with divorce papers saying she couldn't live with a disabled man and deserved better. 
I had a feeling it was coming but it still hit hard. A few friends told me Susan was seen around town with this middle-aged dude, and rumors were flying that she had an affair either before or right after my accident. It was only two months after the crash, and I was still in the hospital when she handed me the papers. I was crushed, angry, and totally lost. I was wheelchair-bound, broke, and had just lost my family. My savings were gone, used up for bills and the kids' education. Thankfully insurance covered some of the hospital costs but I was left with nothing. I was living with my elderly mother who was struggling to support both of us. It was humiliating, being a 35-year-old man relying on a 62-year-old mother. When I tried to see my kids, Susan had already moved in with her new boyfriend, a wealthy guy with a history of failed marriages. She wouldn't let me see my kids and threatened me with a restraining order if I tried. I was devastated. She told me I was a burden and that I should just go away. I was heartbroken and humiliated, but my mom was my rock. She helped me get through it and motivated me to turn my life around. I joined her flower shop, and over time I saw its potential. I reached out to old contacts, secured some event contracts, and eventually started my own event management business. It took 12 long years, but I rebuilt my life. I never gave up, thanks to my mom's support. Last year I found out Susan and her boyfriend were leaving the city with my kids. I tried to see them, but they were already gone. I had been trying to contact them for years. But Susan always pushed me away and used her boyfriend's wealth and connections to keep me at bay. Even though I couldn't challenge her decisions or afford a lawyer, I kept fighting. Finally I managed to get joint custody and will have my kids, Laura and Lucas, for 15 days. They're now 17 and 15, and I'm both nervous and excited to see them. I know I can't make up for the lost years, but I want to make the most of the time we have together. I'm worried about what they've been told about me, and whether I should share my side of the story. Any advice on how to approach them or handle this situation would be much appreciated. I'm just trying to figure out how to navigate this and reconnect with my kids after all this time. I missed two critical pieces of information in my original post first about my current wife Amy. Yes, I remarried a beautiful woman five years ago. Amy is an interior designer, I met her at an event where she was designing the wedding venue and we were providing the flowers, I was yet to start my own company at that time. It wasn't love at first sight, but we vibed well. We kept meeting for such events in the next few months and became friends. She was a single mother of a three-year-old daughter. The idea of starting the event management company was hers because she worked for one of the companies for many years and had the contacts and knowledge of the business. I partnered with her to launch the business. We dated for a year before getting married. Now we live as a happy family of four, Amy, her daughter Mia, my mother and I. Her daughter was delighted to get a granny, and so was my mother. The second information was regarding accident compensation. I was hit by a speeding truck. So ideally I should have been compensated by the logistics company owning the truck. But at that time, the company got away with paying nothing by manipulating the facts about the accident and pinning the blame on me. I could not hire a good lawyer back then so I didn't get a penny. You know how big companies work. They pay in bombs to their attorneys to save their backs. After my marriage with Amy, she suggested I refile the case since we could afford a suitable lawyer. The case is still in court, but my lawyer has given us a positive hint that the judgment would come in our favor. All right, coming back to my story. As I mentioned in my original post three months ago, my children were supposed to visit me after 12 years of my divorce. I was excited and nervous. But Amy calmed me down and supported me all this while. I went to pick them up from the airport. The elder one, Laura, is 15 now, and the younger one, Lucas, is 13. They have grown up to be beautiful and handsome teenagers. After the initial greetings, we ran short of conversations. It was awkward for all three of us. On our way to the house from the airport, I tried to break the ice and ask them about their school life and city. I deliberately skipped the conversation regarding their mother. They, too, didn't bring her up. The children were unusually silent or maybe looking for an opportunity to plug into their earphones, like any other teenager. Upon reaching home, we were welcomed by Amy. The children looked shocked as if they didn't anticipate this coming. I don't know why Amy was a surprise to them. When her mother could live with another man within months of our divorce, why can't I remarry? Amy had set up the guest room for the children. We had lunch together, and Amy laid out the vacation itinerary we had planned for the family. They gave a neutral reaction to everything. Neither were they excited nor did they dismiss the plan. Amy and I were confused by their mixed response. They locked themselves up in their room, and soon after that I got a call from their mother Susan, accusing me of tricking our children. She said I'd brought the children to my house so Amy and I could manipulate them. I felt disoriented by her behavior. She accused me of hiding the truth about my marriage. I wondered at her accusations. I hung up on her but she persistently called me. I decided to address the elephant in the room. I called my children and asked them what was the matter. After the initial hesitance, they spoke up. They were mad at me because it was said to them that I had abandoned them. Susan had brainwashed the children against me and had filled their heads with all lies and deceit. I revealed to them the exact truth that it was not their mother jumped to another man as soon as she got the opportunity. 
they were kids back then, yet they remember those incidents very well. I told them how Susan disappeared with them to the old man's house and how she had threatened and chased me away whenever I tried to contact them. I showed them the restraining letter and all my rejected pleadings I made to meet them. They were in tears and regretted believing in their mother's lies all these years. My younger son, Lucas, admitted that once, he tried to reach out to me on social media, but Susan caught him. She emotionally blackmailed him and took a promise from him that he would never contact me again. The children also admitted to having been rebuked by Susan's husband. Susan and the children were mistreated at the family gatherings because they were unmarried. Susan continued to stay as a mistress in his house. Although the man paid for their education, he was never a fatherly figure to them. My heart ached as I got to know about my children's adversity. After all the truths came out, we hugged each other and cried our hearts out. We went for a week-long vacation in Florida and had a great time together. Laura and Lucas bonded with Amy and Mia, who was turning eight this year. I couldn't be happier seeing all my family together. My children uploaded our group photos on social media, captioning them happy family. As soon as Susan saw those photographs, she called them up and berated them for their foolish behavior. She blamed them for betraying her by bonding with us. She texted me, threatening that she would not let me meet my children further if I did anything to turn them against her. I laughed at her hollow threats and continued with our happy family time. I'm proud to say that Laura and Lucas will be living with us until they start their college. They have already enrolled themselves in the local school and are excited about their new life. Susan showed up at my office last week. She asked for my forgiveness and was bitter about my new family. She tried to sweet-talk me into getting me back into her life, but I made it clear that Amy and Mia were my real family. I also told her that I wasn't going to play along with her guilt-tripping and manipulative games anymore. Susan's current partner abandoned her because of her unreasonable demands and manipulative behavior. Her new relationship ended, and my children had cut all ties with her. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you. My wife betrayed Maine on our European dream trip. I walked away, leaving our marriage and life plans in ruins. I'm a 33-year-old dude, and my wife is also 33. About a month back, she confessed to having a drunken one-night stand with two random strangers we met while partying in Europe. Honestly, it feels unreal even as I type this out. We've been together for 11 years and married for the last two. My wife's been battling some serious depression for about five years now, feeling stuck in her career and a lot of her life choices. I've been trying my best to be her support system, but after two years of this, I'm starting to feel drained. During this time, she turned to alcohol to cope, and I feel like we got stuck in a rut. We tried couples counseling, and the therapist suggested we chase after our dream life together to reignite our passion for life and each other. My wife has always dreamed of living abroad, and after a bit of convincing, I agreed to take a year off work to join her on this overseas adventure. I knew it wasn't the smartest financial move, but she'd supported my career before, even moving around our home country to accommodate my job. So, I figured I'd support her this time. Long story short, things didn't get better. Four months into our trip, her depression worsened. One night we went out for dinner and ended up meeting a group of American tourists, three guys and a girl. We got hammered and had a blast. They were super chill and even bought us a few drinks. By the end of the night, they invited us to their Airbnb to keep the party going. I remember being at their place, munching on pizza and playing a board game. Somehow, it turned into truth or dare. I stepped away to hit the bathroom, and when I came back, I caught my wife locked in a passionate kiss with one of the guys. My blood was boiling I wanted to flip out on the dude, but everyone around tried to play it off, saying it was just part of the game. My wife backed them up, claiming it was all in good fun, but it wasn't fun for me. I just saw the woman I love kissing a guy we barely knew for a few hours. I told her we needed to bounce right then, and we headed home. The Uber ride back was dead silent, and when we got home, she apologized, blaming it on the booze and the game. I crashed hard that night. I woke up around 4 a.m. and noticed she wasn't in bed. Figured she was in the bathroom, so I went to check, but she wasn't there. I thought she might be in the kitchen, so I didn't go looking too hard. But when I checked my phone and realized it wasn't where I left it, I started to panic. My phone was missing. And so was she. I looked everywhere kitchen, backyard, even under the bed. I couldn't call anyone since my phone was MIA. I thought about knocking on neighbors' doors but held off since it was still early. I just stood at the door, waiting until 6 a.m. when she finally pulled up in an Uber. I rushed over, worried sick, and grilled her about where she'd been. She said she left her phone at the Airbnb and used mine to order an Uber. She claimed she didn't want to wake me because I was out cold, so she went alone. I pressed her on why it took so long since it was only a 15-minute ride. At first, she said she got tired and fell asleep there. But when she saw I wasn't buying it, she switched her story to say that one of the guys hit her phone and made her stay until morning to get it back. I threatened to go to the Airbnb and confront him, and that's when she changed her story again, saying she chose to stay because she was tired, 
and nobody forced her. I called her out, saying I knew she was hiding something and demanded she spill it, or I'd head back to the Airbnb myself. The next day, she finally admitted she kissed him multiple times, and he might have touched her inappropriately, but she couldn't remember clearly. At that moment, I knew there was more to the story, and I wasn't going to get the whole truth unless I confronted them. Despite her trying to dissuade me, I hopped into an Uber and went back to the Airbnb. I picked up a sturdy branch from the sidewalk, just in case. When I knocked, one of the guys definitely not the one who kissed her answered. He tried to slam the door, but I pushed my way in, brandishing my makeshift weapon. I demanded the truth. While my wife hadn't confessed to sleeping with them, I was pretty sure something had gone down. He got defensive, saying my wife had told them I was cool with her coming back alone to get her phone. From his confession, it was clear she hadn't just slept with the guy she kissed but both of them at the same time. He insisted it was consensual and even showed me pictures where she looked happy and smiling. I went home fuming and confronted her again. This time she spilled it all. Apparently she left her phone behind as an excuse to go back and continue the party. When she got there, instead of leaving, she got into it again with the same guy, and then the other guy joined in. They took her to the bedroom and took turns with her. The third guy and the girl were in a relationship, so they didn't participate in any of that craziness. She kept saying sorry, blaming it on the alcohol again, but I reminded her that she couldn't use that excuse twice. I was in a tough spot financially, having taken a year off work mainly for her career. I felt completely blindsided. We've always had a happy, healthy relationship, supporting each other through everything, usually with smiles. She assured me this had nothing to do with her feelings for me, or a desire to end things. She said her depression was so heavy that she just wanted a brief escape, a chance to relive her carefree single days. She was filled with regret and willing to do anything to fix our relationship. Logically, I get it, and I believe her when she says she still loves me. But I can't wrap my head around how someone who claims to love me could just toss it all away so thoughtlessly. She begged me to stay, but I took the first flight back to the States, jobless since I'd taken that year-long sabbatical. We only have one car, which is in her name, and I'm crashing on an inflatable mattress at my mom's place. I feel completely devalued and betrayed. I gave up so much to support her in this overseas adventure. What's worse is that I don't feel ready to confide in my family about what really happened. It's weird, but I feel more comfortable sharing with strangers online. We had a phone convo the other day because I told her I was planning to file for divorce and let my family know. She begged me not to, knowing how strict my family can be and that they'd never forgive her if they found out. I'm not sure what I'm looking for advice or just someone to listen. I can't fully disclose what happened to many people in my life right now. I want to start individual therapy ASAP because I feel like I've lost a huge part of myself. I'm ready to let go of my old life, the one I thought I shared with the woman I loved. It feels like I'm mourning not just our past but our future too. After I told her I was filing for divorce, she flew back home, trying to convince me she'd go to therapy and tackle her personal issues, including her drinking. She fully owns her mistake and takes responsibility for what happened. We don't have kids, but we do own a house together. We spent our 20s studying, traveling and working in different parts of our country before settling down. Starting a family was definitely on our radar, but we weren't rushing. We had other stuff to focus on, like building our careers and saving for our dream home. What really hits me hard is that after that first kiss, she consciously chose to go back and make things worse by sleeping with two guys. That's what's tearing me apart. Even if she was drunk, she made that choice to return. There's no going back. No amount of therapy can fix this. The whole scene keeps playing in my mind, and it's driving me nuts. As for STD testing, I haven't been intimate with her since that night. Just the thought of her initial kiss is enough to kill any desire. I'm heading to get tested today. I've thought about asking her if she's cheated before because it seems unlikely that her first affair would involve two guys at once. But really, what's the point? We're heading for divorce anyway. I've read plenty of stories about infidelity and why some people choose to stay and work it out. It's not as simple as just cheating and dumping her. Every situation is unique and should be judged on its own. But for me, I know I can't trust her again, and the mental image of her with those two guys is something I can't shake off, even though I wasn't there. I need time alone to reevaluate my whole life, because it's tough to picture a future without her, after all we've been through. She's tried to set up a meet-up but I'm determined to end things. What's your experience with sharing the details of infidelity with friends and family? I feel sick having to lie about what really happened, but at the same time I feel like telling the truth would bring shame on both of us. It's frustrating having to explain a watered-down version of why we're taking a break and why we cut our trip short. Thanks for listening, everyone. I've started therapy and managed to share everything with a friend who gets it, which felt like a huge relief. But every day is still a battle. Nothing seems to distract me, and sleep has become elusive. I end up crashing from exhaustion rather than actually getting a good night's sleep. Being back at my mom's feels like going back to my childhood. I know I need time to process all of this, but these first few days are just brutal. 
My cheating wife of 23 years begged for forgiveness after her boyfriend dumped her, but I refused to take her back and found my strength. I'm a 50-year-old guy, and I've been hitched to my wife Amy for over two decades minus 23 years, to be exact. We've got three kids together, Rachel, 22, Jake, 19, and Ava, who's about to turn 18. Recently, my world flipped upside down when Amy came clean about cheating on me with her co-worker, Matt, who's 27. Just a week ago, she sat me down and dropped the bombshell that she'd been seeing this guy for the last two years. She claimed she finally felt ready to tell me because, with the kids being older, it seemed like the right time. I was crushed. Thank goodness the kids weren't home. I can't imagine how they would have felt seeing me break down like that. Rachel had moved out for work, Jake was at college, and Ava was out with friends that day, which I guess is why Amy chose that moment to spill the beans. While I was sobbing, begging her to reconsider and give our marriage another shot, she kept saying she couldn't stay in a loveless marriage anymore. It felt like my entire life was crumbling right in front of me. After half an hour of tears I finally got my act together and told her to leave. She looked shocked that I flipped from begging her to asking her to pack up and bounce, but honestly, I couldn't handle her anymore. She grabbed a few things from her duffel bag, which made me think she'd been planning this for a while. After a stiff side hug she walked out, and I was left feeling like a wreck. For the next couple of hours, I just cried. When Ava came back she found me passed out on the couch, and my puffy eyes gave it all away. She kept asking where her mom was, and I knew I had to tell her the truth. Saying it out loud made it real, and I ended up crying again, but Ava was there for me. She was just as shocked as I was. Ava ended up making calls to get Rachel and Jake back home, and even reached out to my brother Eric. He's a solid guy, 45, still single, and has always been my rock. He showed up a few hours later, ready to help out. It's been a week, and he's still here, along with the kids, trying to navigate this mess together. It still feels surreal, like I'm stuck in a nightmare. I had no idea how much Amy leaving would affect my mental health. I've been struggling to get out of bed in the mornings, but I'm trying to stay strong for my kids. When Ava got home, she found me sleeping on the couch. I told her what happened, and it felt embarrassing to cry in front of her, but she hugged me tight and comforted me. I hadn't told anyone else what was going on, but Ava made sure Rachel and Jake came home ASAP. Eric moved in to help us all out. It's been a real blessing having him around. He's been taking care of things, allowing me to grieve and process everything without feeling completely lost. His presence has brought a sense of stability, helping to ease the chaotic feelings swirling in my head. On the legal side of things, I've talked to my lawyer about divorce. I haven't filed yet because I was waiting for Amy to serve me, but I found out why she hasn't done it yet. Last night she called me out of the blue. I was shocked since we hadn't talked since she left. She sounded upset, crying about how Matt dumped her too. Apparently he wasn't ready to settle down and told her straight up that he just wanted to have fun. Amy was sobbing on the phone, realizing she had nowhere to go. She admitted our kids weren't talking to her anymore, and that she'd been living in a hotel since she left. She finally called me to ask if she could move back in and give our marriage another chance. I was floored how could she even ask me that after what she did. I felt a rush of anger, and I told her right then and there that there would be no second chances. She didn't give me one, so why should I? I hung up, needing to clear my head. I was furious that she thought I'd just welcome her back after everything. For years I'd always been the one trying to fix things between us but I was done. I couldn't overlook this betrayal. It was like a reality check, showing me how much I'd loved her compared to how much she loved me. I needed to put myself first this time. After I turned my phone back on, I found a bunch of angry texts from her, acting like the victim. She was furious I wasn't thinking of her feelings which blew my mind. She cheated on me, and now I'm the bad guy. She's even accused me of turning our kids against her, which isn't true I had no clue they'd blocked her until after she confessed. Honestly, I don't feel guilty at all. I know I'm not being cruel, I'm just standing my ground. I'm tired of being manipulated. I still care for her deep down but I'm not letting that cloud my judgment anymore. It's time for me to focus on my healing and the future. It's been a couple of days since Amy's been blowing up my phone, trying to convince me to take her back. She's pulled out all the stops guilt trips, gaslighting you name it. She keeps apologizing, claiming she made a huge mistake with the whole affair and promises she'll do everything to make it up to me. But I just don't get why she thinks I'd even consider taking her back after everything. This isn't some petty argument. This is a complete betrayal, and she still doesn't grasp how monumental that is for me. Honestly, I doubt she ever will. I'm feeling a bit better now so I've sent Rachel and Jake back to their normal routines. Ava's still living with me and checks in regularly, which I really appreciate. I've told her not to hold back from going out and having fun with her friends, she deserves that. We're all going through a tough time, but I want her to enjoy her last few months at home before heading off to college. My brother Eric is still around and I'm super thankful for his support. I've talked about the emotional fallout of Amy's actions, but the practical side of things has also taken a hit. With Amy gone, we've had to pick up her share of the chores, which feels petty, but is a constant reminder of her absence. She used to handle all the laundry said she enjoyed it, but now it's on me and Eric since Ava's busy living her life. Eric's been a godsend, helping me out while I process everything. He's not overly emotional, 
but his presence has been exactly what I needed. I know he'll have to go back to his life eventually, but I'm really lucky he's here now. On the legal front, my lawyer and I have already filed for divorce. We got the ball rolling yesterday, especially since Amy's been in limbo, not filing herself because she thought she could come back. She'll be served in a couple of days, and then the real battle begins. Just thinking about it is exhausting, and I can't even imagine how much more draining it'll be once it's all underway. I never thought I'd find myself in this situation, but here we are. It's a horrible feeling, but at least I know I did my best to keep our marriage intact. Whatever happens now is on her, not me. I'm also grateful that my kids are all grown up. I can't imagine how much more complicated this would be if we were dealing with custody issues. Today, Amy was served the divorce papers, and judging by the texts she sent, it hit her hard. I haven't blocked her yet. I guess I just haven't mustered the strength to cut her off completely. But I know that day is coming soon. She fired off a bunch of nasty messages, blaming me for ruining her life and claiming I'm taking revenge for her trying to have a little fun to escape her boring existence. She even threw in some digs about my age, saying I look it. Sure, I've let myself go a bit. I quit hitting the gym ages ago, and my hairline is receding, but that's just part of getting older. I'm a dad of three almost adult kids, so of course I look my age. I'm not even out of shape. I'm just a normal guy aging like everyone else. If she wants me to look like I did when we first got married, that's not realistic. I can't help but think she's just projecting her own insecurities. It's pathetic how she's still trying to shift the blame onto me, acting like her cheating was somehow justified and that I should have been the one to fix myself. But I guess that's just who she is. Now, I'm finally recognizing all the red flags I ignored for over 20 years because I loved her. And yeah, I still feel a flicker of that love deep down which is embarrassing to admit but it's the truth. That's what's kept me from blocking her completely. I'm just hoping I find the strength to do it soon because I can't deal with this side of her anymore. I wouldn't call it her evil side. It's more like a cruel comedy at this point. The way she's handling this situation is just absurd. Ironically, Amy's been having drama with Matt. Apparently she posted a rant online about how he strung her along for two years and then dumped her because he didn't see a future with her. It's wild to think she left everything behind for this guy without even talking to him first. Now, she's getting roasted online and I'm not even mad about it. Fast forward a month, and we're in the settlement negotiations phase. It's funny how I look at Amy now and feel absolutely nothing. She smiles at me sometimes during the meetings and tries to talk to me after them, but I do my best to avoid her and keep my distance. As far as I know, she's living with a friend of hers now and has been fired from her previous job. But I don't think I'll have to give her any alimony because of the very public confession of her infidelity on Facebook, thanks to her delusional belief that Matt would be serious about her at some point. I don't even need to prove that she'd been cheating because she did all the work for me herself. My kids are still not speaking to her, and we like to pretend that she doesn't even exist anymore. I know it's not exactly healthy, but we'll think about that later when some time has passed. Right now, it's way too fresh to be discussed. Emotionally, I'm doing a lot better than I was when I first posted here, and I know it'll just get better with time. I'm probably going to start therapy in a few days once I have more time after the divorce is finalized or something, and maybe that'll help me feel okay about everything eventually. I thought our marriage was rock solid until I discovered my wife was cheating on me with a close friend. Now, I'm left to pick up the pieces. We've been married since we were 19, and next year marks our 25th anniversary. We have three daughters, a 19-year-old in college and twin 15-year-olds. Life at home seemed pretty normal, or so I thought, but lately, something has felt off. My wife has always had her own job and interests like yoga and pottery, which I respect. I've got my own hobbies too, but over the past few months, there's been an underlying tension. Sometimes, she seems distant, even during intimate moments. We still have our regular weekend morning lovemaking, but it feels like her mind is somewhere else. It's frustrating because I can't quite put my finger on what's wrong. I've asked her if something is bothering her, but every time she assures me everything is fine. I wouldn't immediately suspect infidelity, but I've noticed she's been spending more time outside the house lately, maybe for the last six months. She's been busy, but she used to be so upbeat, energetic, and almost giddy. About three weeks ago, everything shifted. Suddenly she started hanging around the house more often, but she seemed distant. She'd come to my office to chat, but she had this sad look in her eyes, like she was carrying some heavy burden. It's like she wants to be near me, which I appreciate, but her behavior worries me. Even weirder, our twins are acting strange too. They've been unusually sweet, offering to help with chores like taking out the trash definitely not their usual behavior. It's as if they know something I don't, like I'm missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. Their odd yet affectionate behavior started a few weeks ago, around the same time my wife's behavior changed. A couple of months ago I happened to glance at our Verizon bill and noticed a ton of texts between my wife and an unknown number. When I asked her about it, she claimed it was just one of her girlfriends. But when I checked her phone, there were no texts from that number at all. I pressed her again, and she said she deleted them to save space, but it didn't add up. Why would she delete only those texts? The last six months have felt strange, but the last three weeks have been downright bizarre. Yesterday, 
I made the decision to call my oldest daughter. I shared everything I mentioned here, and she assured me she would talk to the twins. The twins really look up to her, and they tend to be a bit scared when she gets mad. This morning she called me back and said she had spoken to the twins. She's coming home this Friday for the weekend, so we can have a proper conversation. I told her I can't handle being left hanging like this. It's too much for my heart to bear. I pleaded with her to tell me what's going on. She mentioned that it's bad but could have been worse. She reassured me not to worry and explained that Friday is the earliest she can come home to talk. She did mention that there's some good news amidst the bad. However, the twins made her promise to keep it a secret. It's important to note that my wife and the twins are unaware that our oldest daughter is coming home this weekend, and she explicitly told me not to inform them. She was very firm about that. I apologize for not having much of an update to share. It seems like I'll have to wait until Friday to find out more. Some of the responses I've received here and other threads I've read have left me terrified. It feels like stories like mine never end happily. I'm fearing the worst, thinking that my wife might have had an affair and that the twins know about it. My daughter was being cryptic during our phone call and clearly wants to discuss this matter in person rather than over the phone. As it turns out, my worst fears were confirmed. The person my wife had an affair with wasn't a co-worker or someone from her hobbies. Shockingly. It was a friend of ours the husband of one of the couples we were close with. Needless to say, he will never be considered a friend again, and I'm determined to let his wife know about what happened. The twins caught my wife with him when she was supposed to be at yoga. They were extremely upset and confronted her about it. She assured them that she had no intention of leaving me or anything like that. According to her, it was just a fling. They both enjoyed the thrill of being like teenagers, secretly dating and sneaking around. She didn't realize the devastating impact it would have on our family. What she has put the twins through is almost unforgivable. As soon as the twins exposed the affair, my wife ended it immediately. She had planned on keeping this secret for the rest of her life. She told the girls that she should carry the guilt, and that if she told me, it would alleviate her guilt but completely crush me, which it has. The girls agreed, and they were all set on keeping this secret. However, my oldest daughter became furious with all of them. I'm still processing everything that has happened. I packed a bag and left, causing my wife to break down and cry on the floor. I turned off the location services on my phone and drove about an hour away to a cabin in one of our state parks. Right now, I don't feel like talking to anyone. Only my oldest daughter knows where I am. She came to visit me today and we had a good conversation. She expressed that it's not surprising for her mother to do something like this because she's always been a predictable stereotype. My wife tends to follow trends whether it's yoga, essential oils, gad or any new shiny thing that comes along. Now, in her middle age, she's just becoming another stereotype. The twins are angry at their mother and worried that I won't come back home. Honestly, I'm not sure if I will either. Right now, I don't really want to talk to them either. My oldest daughter said she'll come home as soon as her semester is over and make their lives miserable. She had to leave a couple of hours ago to go back to school and now the sadness is setting in. Here I am, a middle-aged guy sitting alone in a cabin, thinking I had my life all planned out, but now everything is uncertain. I probably won't post about this again. I'm going to stay here for as long as I can afford it and figure out my next steps. I asked my wife to leave and give me some space. However, she responded with determination, saying no. I won't abandon our beautiful life and love just because of my stupid mistake. I'll fight for us with every ounce of strength I have and make things right. Together, there's nothing we can't do that's just how she is. It's always been her nature to be stubborn, so I'm unsure of what to do. I genuinely need some space. Staying at this cabin has been really therapeutic, especially with its amazing hiking trails. However, I know it's only a temporary solution, and I eventually have to go back home. But I also know my wife. With the way she expressed herself, it would take an act of God to make her leave. On top of that, she won't give me the space I need. If I go back home, She'll overwhelm me with her love and incessantly try to wear me down until I go along with whatever plan she has in mind. Frankly, I'd rather stay away for a while. I need to be mentally prepared to withstand her onslaught of affection and rationalization, because she's an expert in that. She's always reading those self-help and motivational books and browsing websites filled with that kind of stuff. I made sure to pay for the cabin in cash for a week, so that my wife wouldn't be able to track me down if I used a credit card. I already received emails notifying me that someone used a different device to access my credit card accounts, both of them. It's definitely her. I knew if I paid with a credit card, she would look it up and try to find me. I also had a conversation with the twins, assuring them that they were in a difficult situation, but it wasn't their fault. I made sure to let them know that their dad loves them. They mentioned that on Friday, mom was a complete mess, crying uncontrollably. However, by late Saturday, she seemed to shift into her I can fix this, we will overcome mindset. Supposedly, she's been reading everything she can find online about repairing a marriage after infidelity. I used to commute back and forth from the cabin for work, but luckily, we're all working remotely now. It's actually a relief because I'm about 100 miles away from home. I've been allowing my wife to have a short phone call with me each night, just to let everyone know that I'm okay. But honestly, 
I don't want to be bothered. I prefer communicating with my daughters through text messages. It surprises me how many young people don't realize that smartphones can actually be used for making phone calls. If I want to hold on to my pride, then I have to divorce her because her actions have been a serious betrayal of our marriage. But if I choose to stay in the marriage, it means surrendering my pride as a man, and I don't think I can live like that. I don't even want to have a discussion with my wife about this because she has a way of twisting things around and making me agree with her logic within an hour. Unfortunately, my time at the cabin is coming to an end. I've been trying to find an apartment to rent, but it's tougher than I expected due to the ongoing virus situation. I told my wife that there's no way for me to stay with her and still maintain my dignity. I explained that if I stayed, I wouldn't be the man she claimed to love. It would just make me feel broken and resentful, lacking any sense of dignity. I made it clear that we can't continue living like that. She responded by saying we can work things out and that I'm the only man she loves. I replied that obviously, our marriage isn't great if she did what she did. After a conversation we both agreed that it's time to go our separate ways. I also spoke with my heartbroken twins, assuring them that I love them and will always be there for them. After deep reflection, I've realized that I can't stay with someone who betrayed me in such a way. My self-respect and dignity are important to me, and I would lose both if I stayed in the relationship. My best friend stole my girlfriend after I helped him now they're together, but I'm glad to be free from their toxic drama. I'm a 33-year-old guy let's call me Jake my so-called best friend, we'll name him Mike, is also 33. Mike and I had been inseparable since high school. We met in homeroom on the first day and clicked instantly. We were like brothers, sharing everything from our deepest secrets to our wildest dreams. There was nothing we hid from each other our dating lives, our fears, our failures. He was the one person I trusted completely. Despite our close bond, I always hesitated to introduce Mike to any women I was interested in. His dating history was, to put it mildly, a train wreck. He'd had four ex-girlfriends, two of whom cheated on him one was sleeping with multiple men, and the other was two-timing him for a year. He cheated on his third girlfriend to be with his fourth. On top of that, he frequently visited prostitutes. Mike came from a wealthy family, his mother was well off, and he'd never worked a day in his life. Money was never an issue for him. On the other hand, I had always been cautious in matters of the heart. Until I met Emma, I'd never been in a relationship. At 33, I was a virgin who had never even held a woman's hand. That all changed on January 13th, 2019, when I matched with Emma on a dating app. She was 26, vibrant, and full of life. From our first date, I was smitten. The first two years with Emma were like a dream. We traveled together, exploring new places and creating memories that I thought would last a lifetime. We often hung out with Mike and his girlfriend at the time. It felt like everything was falling into place. But when the pandemic hit, Mike's girlfriend broke up with him and moved back to China suddenly, it was just the three of us. We started spending more time together playing video games, watching movies, just hanging out. When restaurants reopened, we'd go out to eat. Sometimes, Mike would take Emma out for dinner on his own. I didn't think much of it, she lived close to his favorite restaurants, and he was my best friend. I trusted both of them implicitly. But as their outings became more frequent, a gnawing feeling started to eat at me. Emma would come home later and later, always with some excuse or another. She'd send me pictures of the food they ate, assuring me it was just dinner. I tried to push aside my doubts, reminding myself that Mike was like a brother to me. In January 2021, I began helping Emma's family renovate a new house they had purchased. I was working two days a week at my job, spending the other five days on the renovation. It was exhausting but fulfilling work. One day, while tossing out wooden planks, I slipped and broke my wrist. The injury required surgery, and I found myself more dependent on Emma than ever. Her birthday was approaching on April 29th, and I wanted to make it special despite my injury. I planned a trip for us, covering both her birthday and the following day. Everything seemed perfect until we returned home. Mike was waiting for us with a birthday cake for Emma. He handed her a custom engraved iPad in her favorite color. She was overjoyed, and I couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy. A week later, my world began to crumble. Emma called me out of the blue to break up with me. She said she didn't see a future with me because I didn't make enough money. She called me lazy, criticized me for not having a second job, and compared me unfavorably to Mike, who didn't have to work at all. She even mentioned that I was two minutes late in wishing her a happy birthday at midnight something I hadn't realized mattered realized. When I asked who had beaten me to it, she coldly replied, You don't need to know later I found out it was Mike devastated. I turned to Mike for support. I confided in him about the breakup, hoping for some solace. He claimed he had no idea we had split and mentioned that he had taken Emma out to dinner a few days prior. He told me she hadn't mentioned me at all during their time together. Mike assured me he was there for me, encouraging me to reach out whenever I needed. Over the next few weeks we spoke every day, sometimes for hours. He was my rock during that painful time. Then, unexpectedly, Emma reached out, asking to get back together. I was torn but agreed, hoping we could rebuild what we had lost. Things seemed to improve, 
We talked about moving in together, saving money for a place of our own. We even planned a three-day vacation with a group of friends, including Mike, but Mike advised me to reconsider moving in with her. He pointed out that she had broken up with me when I broke my wrist a huge red flag, he said. His words planted seeds of doubt in my mind. Around that time, I started physical therapy for my wrist. There were a couple of attractive therapists, and I casually mentioned them to Mike. I confessed I was having doubts about my relationship with Emma. He suggested I keep her in the dark while pursuing the therapists, using Emma as a fallback option. The idea disgusted me. I couldn't imagine betraying someone like that. Determined to fix my relationship, I delved into self-help articles, trying to find ways to make things work with Emma one day. She noticed the tabs open on my laptop articles about when to break up and signs a relationship is failing. She confronted me, accusing me of liking someone else. She admitted someone had asked her out during our relationship but claimed she turned him down because she was committed to me. We argued, but eventually made up and decided to go on the trip as planned. Before we left, Mike moved into a new apartment. He asked me to help set it up furniture, TVs the works. He mentioned he was creating a bachelor pad, eager to jump back into the dating scene. I was happy for him, glad he was moving forward, but then he stopped answering my calls and texts. The last time I spoke to him was on June 30th. He later claimed he was busy setting up his apartment, but something felt off. On the day of the trip, Emma insisted on sitting in the front seat with Mike, claiming she got car sick. Throughout the vacation, they were inseparable playing arcade games, exploring together, leaving me behind. Friends took pictures of them whispering among themselves. I felt like an outsider. After we returned, things with Emma grew colder. She was distant, often unresponsive to my messages. On my birthday, she barely acknowledged me, leaving halfway through the day. That night was the last time I saw her. We had an argument over the phone a few days later. Frustrated and hurt, I said things I shouldn't have. She hung up on me, and we didn't speak again. Weeks passed, and I heard nothing from either of them. Then, on August 28th, a mutual friend called me. He said Mike had announced that he and Emma were officially dating and living together. Mike had asked him to keep it a secret from me, but our friend thought I deserved to know. My heart shattered. I felt betrayed in the deepest sense. That night, Mike finally called me. He admitted everything, saying he couldn't help himself. He claimed Emma was his soulmate, that being with her made him feel alive. He showed no remorse, even suggesting I should be happy for them. I asked him how he could do this to me, reminding him of all the times we'd shared the trust we'd built over two decades. He dismissed my feelings, saying I'd get over it and that there were plenty of other women out there. In that moment, I realized the depth of his betrayal. Not only had he stolen the woman I loved, but he had also shattered our lifelong friendship. I felt utterly alone. In the weeks that followed, I spiraled into a dark place. I reached out to Emma's father, hoping for some closure, but he never responded. Emma had blocked me on all platforms, cutting me off completely. I couldn't sleep, haunted by nightmares of them together. My chest ached with a pain I couldn't describe. To make matters worse, my mother, who had been battling stage 4 lung cancer, was told her treatments were no longer effective. She was placed in hospice care. The weight of losing her, combined with the betrayal of the two people I trusted most, was unbearable. Desperate for answers, I began researching personality disorders, trying to make sense of their actions. I came to believe that Mike was a sociopath and a narcissist, and that Emma shared similar traits. It didn't excuse what they did, but it helped me understand that their betrayal was a reflection of their own brokenness, not mine. Months later, I reconnected with Lisa, one of Mike's ex-girlfriends. She revealed that Mike had been living a double life, dating multiple women simultaneously, lying to everyone. Together, we confronted his father, who was devastated to learn the truth about his son. The more I uncovered, the more I realized how toxic Mike had always been. He wasn't the friend I thought he was. He was a manipulator, using people for his own gain. Over time, the pain began to lessen. I focused on healing, diving into self-improvement books, therapy, and new hobbies. I learned to value myself, to set boundaries, and to recognize red flags in others. I won't pretend that everything is perfect now. There are days when the memories resurface, and the hurt feels fresh again. But I've come to accept that some people aren't meant to stay in our lives and sometimes, the hardest lessons, the hardest lessons are the most valuable. I lost my first love and my best friend, but I found myself. Thanks for watching till the end, wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share, I'd love to hear from you.